Well, good morning, everyone. I'm uh, Rob Atkinson. I'm president of Ice Guy Out. I want to welcome you to this event. That we're really uh, on intellectual property and where we can go with that. I'm really honored that um, um, we have uh, Victoria Espinal, who's, uh, as you all know, the White House coordinator now. We're the first first position, the first, first person to fill this position that was created uh, recently by Congress. Uh, and so we're going to hear from Victoria uh, in just a minute. Um, and then, um, unfortunately, she needs to run to another meeting, so she'll make, take, make a, uh, take a few questions. Uh, then we will move on with the rest of the panel, who I will introduce uh, actually after Victoria finishes up her comments. Um, let me just start by framing this. Why are we having this event? Um, um, the U.S. economy is increasingly dependent upon intellectual property for uh, jobs, for wealth creation, for productivity. Um, right now, over 50% of U.S. exports uh, depend on some form of intellectual property. Uh, in 2005, according to a study by uh, 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 Kevin Tassett and Rob Shapiro, uh, IP accounted for 45% of GDP, uh, and that was larger than any U.S. economy, any world economy. So the U.S. is more dependent on IP than any economy in the world, and yet uh, with that dependence comes incredible risk. Uh, it's really hard to steal a car. Uh, you, you can do it, but it's a little difficult. Uh, it's real easy to steal software. It's real easy to steal, steal the ideas. It's really in, 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 a, in, a, in a product. Um, and so you would think that with the U.S. economy uh, facing still massive trade deficits, even though the deficit is reduced a little bit largely because we're not buying as much, uh, the U.S. faces significant structural problems with its trade deficit uh, and with a relatively anemic job growth. And still, the recovery is proceeding, but it's not proceeding as fast as we all would like it to be. You would think that there would be a broad consensus across the political spectrum in Washington that we should be doing everything possible to defend intellectual property, particularly in foreign countries uh, who do so much uh, essentially to steal it uh, or to violate it. Uh, but you would be wrong, of course, uh, because that's not the way, that's not the view in Washington right now. The view in Washington is much more bifurcated. Uh, there are certainly groups and advocates, including ITIF, who believe strongly in intellectual property protection. There are lo lots of groups who don't. Uh, the Academy, I think, is a, is a hornet's nest of uh, people who believe that IP is essentially is a, is an anachronistic term and should be eliminated. Uh, we've got a new report coming out on Monday where we go over uh, these issues around copyright and some other issues. But let me just give you a couple of quotes. Uh, which to me are emblematic. I didn't just pick these out of thin air. Uh, Wharton professor Joel Wobfogel uh, says that stealing IP is, quote, just a form of do-it-yourself price discrimination. Uh, and of course, Larry Lessig, who we all know, uh, says, quote, copying for a digital network is like breathing to us. So there's a whole sort of intellectual movement in the academy that is trying to justify, on various grounds, uh, essentially very weak IP enforcement. We also see this here in Washington with so-called public interest groups uh, that endlessly argue against any kind of public policy measures, whether they're regulations in different agencies or whether it's uh, international treaties or whether it's bills in Congress uh, that essentially are saying, uh, we don't want any more of that to happen. We see it with ACTA, where groups were opposing ACTA even before they saw any language in it, they were just opposed to it to begin with. We see it in the opposition of groups that go against anybody who's a copyright holder to bring legal action against copyright violators. We see it uh, in opposition uh, right now, the Lady Bill, the Lady Hatch Bill that's in Congress uh, on uh, being able to block piracy websites. So what's behind all of that? Um, I, I would argue that what, what is behind all of that is essentially an ideology that is that essentially sees IP as a zero-sum game where there are winners and there are losers. The winners are big behemoth, behemoth for-profit corporations, and the losers are American consumers. And given that these groups want to help American consumers, their view is, let's just let everything be free. Clearly, that doesn't make any sense. Uh, if it ever did, it certainly doesn't make sense in a global economy uh, where we are dependent, as I said, on IP for high-wage jobs. Uh, so that's why we're really just incredibly encouraged both by Congress's actions to uh, create a position of U.S. intellectual property enforcement coordinator 
and by President Obama's decision to appoint uh, Victoria Espinal as that person who has such a distinguished background and a commitment to IP enforcement. So to introduce Victoria, I'm going to turn it over to Ed Riley, uh, who is the CEO of America's for FD International Limited, who is uh, partnering with us on this event. And so Ed will uh, make a couple comments, introduce Victoria, and then we'll get on with the uh, presentation. Thank you, Ed. Thanks, Robert. Thanks very much. Um, on behalf of FD, you know, I'd like to thank uh, our co-host, uh, IT Dio, for uh, putting together this important event, and thank Victoria for taking time out of your busy day to uh, uh, to join us. Um, as Ron mentioned, in today's uncertain economy, the economic contribution from innovation is more important than ever. Um, in fact, in a recent poll that we just conducted for National Journal, um, we talked about you know the American public's concern about job creation and wage growth. And there is, in fact, a consensus among, uh, among the American people that this area of innovation and, and, and investment in new technologies is likely to lead us out of this, out of this recession. Uh, while, while the political body may move a little bit slowly to recognize that, uh, the American people, I think, are very hopeful that there will be action in this area. Uh, we're here today because we all understand that intellectual property is the foundation of innovation. Industries depend, that depend on intellectual property, including music, movies, software, entertainment, pharmaceutical industries, generated $14.6 billion in trade surplus last year. But in order to maintain, and more importantly, to expand the economic contribution of U.S. creative industries, it's critical to protect their intellectual property, and that debate needs to be fully engaged. I have the privilege of introducing you today our keynote speaker, Victoria Espinal who's the first U.S. intellectual property enforcement cooperator, uh, coordinator. She was nominated by President Obama in September 2009 and is responsible for developing and implementing the administration's overall strategy for enforcement of intellectual property. Victoria has extensive experience in the IP arena, including a recent professorship at George Mason University School of Law, where she taught intellectual property and international trade. And while at George Mason, she was an advisor on IP issues several congressional committees. Victoria also worked at the Office of the U.S. Trade Representative as the Senior Counsel for IP Issues and was first assistant U.S. Trade Representative for Intellectual Property and Innovation at USTR. Since Victoria was sworn in in this past December, her focus has been to gather information and input from government agencies, industry stakeholders, <clears throat> and the public about how to enhance IP rights. And in June, Victoria released a new plan, the Joint Strategic Plan on Intellectual Property Enforcement. We welcome Victoria here today and look forward to hearing from her about her recommendations in the Joint Strategic Plan, what they mean, and importantly, what the next steps are in this important process of protecting IP uh, and the enforcement in the, uh, for uh, U.S. companies here in Florida. Please join me in welcoming Victoria Spano. Thanks very much. Um, thanks to Rob for inviting me to be here today. Um, so uh, it, is, it is true what you said. There are divisions, um, certainly, about intellectual property and intellectual property policy. Although one thing that I would note, um, one area where I think there are less divisions is um, in Congress. I mean, I feel very lucky to be working on an area where there is great bipartisan support. Which is not to say every member of Congress shares exactly the same view on this, but I think this is a an, interesting area for the administration to be acting in because there is strong bipartisan support from you know from Chairman Lakey of the Senate Judiciary Committee, from Senator Hatch, from Lamar Smith and John Conyers. Um, and that's something that I think is just very fortunate for those of us who want to make progress in this area. Um, so as uh, as Rob and Ed mentioned, um, in June the administration released the joint strategic plan on intellectual property enforcement. This uh, is the first time there's ever been a joint strategic plan, not just from this administration, but from any White House. Um, it was very well received, which is gratifying, but obviously um, the true test of the joint strategic plan will be in how well we do in implementing it. So we are, we are very focused right now on implementation of the plan. Um, there were six broad categories for action that we laid out in the joint strategic plan, um, which I will list briefly. Um, but underneath those six broad categories, there were 33 pretty specific action items that we have committed to. So we are pretty far out there in terms of saying exactly what we're going to do um, and uh, giving Congress and the public uh, 
um, measuring stick to hold up uh, to see how we're making progress. In terms of the six broad categories, uh, they are leading by example. So uh, trying to ensure that the US government and its own policies and practices is respecting intellectual property. Uh, transparency, uh, which is obviously a big priority for this administration. Coordination, cooperation, so both in terms of the federal agencies, in terms of our state and local law enforcement, um, working with our trading partners, making sure our efforts are as coordinated and therefore as effective as they can be. Um, enforcing our rights overseas, uh, I don't now need to tell this group that we have uh, significant problems uh, with many of our trading partners and we need to make progress there. Securing our supply chains, so trying to make sure what comes into the United States, both across our borders in terms of physical goods and in the online environment to make sure that those supply chains are as um, clean and unpolluted as possible. Uh, and then building a data-driven government. This is an area where there are uh, definitely data gaps and we'd like to try to address those, or at least as many of them as we can. So those are the six broad categories of action that we decided to focus on as an administration. Um, as I said, there are 33 specific action items. Um, but one thing that I want to emphasize is that the Joint Strategic Plan was not drafted with the intention to be the government's action items for the next 10 years. That was never the intention. Um, it, it shouldn't be, right? Because this is an area that's going to continue to evolve. So while we may have 33 action items today, um, I am reasonably certain that new problems will arise next year. Um, hopefully along with those new problems will come new creative solutions for how to address them. Um, but it's very important to me and to the office and to the administration as a whole that the strategy continue to evolve, that we continue to try to address new problems as they come up, try to anticipate problems before they come up, and try to address them. Um, we have um, a lot of activities that are ongoing now, some of which are public, some of which are, are still sort of um, in the interagency deliberation process, so are less public. Uh, so I'm going to highlight a few. Um, this is sort of a representative sampling, I would say, but certainly I'm happy to take questions after this, either because people want more details to the extent I can give them about some of the things I've talked about, or because there's an area of concern that you didn't hear addressed and you want to know if it's something that we're focused on. Um, so I'm going to start by talking about internet piracy, um, talked about securing the supply chain, um, lots of products, copyright products and trademark products um, are distributed via the internet in various ways. That's a big problem for the administration. There are a number of things that we're doing to try to address that, including on the law enforcement side. One thing that I'm gonna talk about uh, in particular today is our voluntary, what we call our voluntary cooperation initiative. Or, or um, We feel that it is very important, so we are now actively calling on the private sector to do more in this area. In order to have a functioning internet, there are many different types of, uh, of entities and functionalities that you need to make that work. So we are calling on all of those to work cooperatively with the rights holders. Um, and obviously this is first and foremost the responsibility of the right holders and they have to be very much part of the process. But without the different parts of the internet economy working together, it's going to be very <coughs> difficult to make progress. So we think it is very important to have all parts of the internet working together in a way that is practical and efficient, um, in a way that is not unduly burdensome to any of the actors in the space, um, and bearing in mind, of course, um, policy principles that are very important to the administration, such as fair process and free speech. Uh, we are working with uh, payment processors, so credit card companies. We are uh, having discussions with domain name registrars. We are having discussions with search engines. We are having discussions with um, advertisers uh, who operate in various ways, um, with internet service providers, with the whole range of entities that are necessary in order to have an internet that functions the way that we want it to function. Um, some of those discussions have focused more on copyright issues. Some of those discussions have focused more on counterfeit pharmaceuticals and the very serious and unfortunately growing problem of illegal internet pharmacies. Um, we're actually having a meeting with a number of domain name registrars and registries tomorrow to talk more about what they can do um, in the space in the, uh, to address the problem of illegal internet pharmacies. Some registrars are already active in that space, others are less so. We're hopeful that bringing the private sector together to talk about best practices and talk about what it is possible for them to do in a cooperative manner 
um, will result in progress. Um, so that is, that is a big focus for the office right now. In terms of our trading partners, um, uh, well, China is uh, the country <laughs> I hear most. Um, in fact, I would say 98% of the time if a foreign country is brought up, it is China. There are occasional mentions of other countries, but overwhelmingly, um, China is raised as the problem that is true across every business sector that we have met with, which is a, a broad, broad range. Um, it's my belief that uh, you need to have a dual approach with China, um, so sort of a carrot and a stick approach, and we are discussing internally various ways to move forward on that. Um, obviously, China is both an economically complicated issue and a politically sensitive issue. Um, on the other hand, it is clear, I think, to all of us that we need to have a new approach to China. Um, that China is, is, uh, needs to make significant progress um, in terms of its intellectual property. Um, and one of the concerns that we have is that there are this enormous range of problems with China. There are sort of you know, uh, counterfeiting of products, um, but there are also industrial policies that China have in place that are um, a significant disadvantage to our own innovative industries um, and where we need to see change. Um, another initiative that I would mention, because I feel like it might be of interest to this group, possibly not, is we have launched um, a new economic analysis initiative. So I talked a little bit at the beginning of this about data gaps. Um, one of the data gaps, um, one of the areas where we feel the United States government um, could add value in terms of data analysis is trying to get a better sense of what the IP industries mean to our economy as a whole. Now that could, that could be measured in a number of ways. That could be measured by looking at the number of jobs that are attributable to the IP industries. That could be measured by looking at the exports that are attributable to the IP industries. That could be measured by looking at labor characteristics, wage premiums, for example, that um, relate to jobs that come from the IP industries. We are looking at all of these things as possible measurable indicators. Um, this is, let me hasten to add, an ambitious and long-term project um, for the U.S. economy. Luckily, um, there does seem to be, we've, we've brought together an extensive interagency group of economists uh, to think about this, and I think there is um, excitement and interest in sort of taking on what will be a new challenge for the United States government. But, you know, it's my view that this could be enormously important to try to inform our policy making if we have as clear a sense as possible what the economic contribution of the IP industries are to our country. Um, one of the issues that we're facing in terms of our own U.S. government practices is procurement of counterfeit goods. Um, this is a problem in a number of agencies. Uh, we have focused on it first with respect to the Department of Defense because the implications of the Department of Defense procuring counterfeit goods um, are, are negative and obvious, um, but it is not limited to the Department of Defense. So one of the things that we have set up is an interagency working group to focus specifically on procurement issues related to, um, to agencies that are buying IP infringing goods. Um, uh, and again, with our first order of focus being on the Department of Defense, um, but our understanding is that this is a problem that a number of agencies are struggling with, and so we're hoping that bringing the, the government together to talk about better practices here will be helpful in trying to address that issue. Um, I, for those of you who know me, I tend to be a relatively concise speaker, so I think I, I've hit on four out of the 33 things that we've committed to do. Um, that but that's sort of my, my, my guess of what the room would be most interested in. But again, I'm very happy to take questions. Um, we have a very open door policy in Washington, D.C. Um, we have had lots of input when we were putting the Joint Strategic Plan together from an enormous range of industries, um, as well as from academics, from consumer groups, from public interest groups. We have continued that, we want that to continue. So if people have concerns, you should let me know, uh, let the team know, come in and talk to us. I've also tried to get out of D.C. as much as I can. Um, so I, in the six months that we were putting the strategy together, traveled to Silicon Valley, to Los Angeles, to New York. I want to continue going to places in the country that have industries that are affected by this so I can talk to companies directly about the concerns that they're, that they're hearing. I'm actually heading to Chicago 
um, at the October 7th and 8th, at the end of next week, to continue doing that. Um, but inevitably, I will spend most of my time in DC. Um, so I would encourage uh, people to come in and tell us if you have concerns, tell us if you feel like our focus is off, tell us if you have recommendations. What we like most of all are new and creative ideas for how we can address this problem better. Um, but come, come in and see us. say something about uh, China's strategic use of its uh, domestic patent system. This was an issue that was raised uh, by the AmCham report for the first time this last year. The, basically, China has institutionalized our a high volume, low quality model using utility model patents. And are reportedly encouraging Chinese companies to take out a lot of utility model patents that can be used defensively against multinational corporations that are asserting against Chinese companies in the U.S. and Europe. Uh, I, I think we're, we're, we're very concerned about this because it shows prospects of creating a, an opaque, uh, highly thicketed system that uh, needs to be uh, that needs to be translated from Chinese to English, which is a very important, a very expensive process. So uh, the the general concern is that uh, an unmodulated approach to cheerleading for intellectual property will lead to outcomes like we see happening in China, where they uh, manipulate the system so that it works in ways that is caricature our own problems. Sounds interesting. I'm not surprised that the first question is about China in some fashion, although that that is a new issue. So it sounds like there's a report out there that would be of interest. If you would send it to me, that, that'd be great. I'm actually going to be, I'm likely to be heading to China sometime in the next few weeks, so um, information like that is helpful. Okay. It is in James McGregor's report for the, uh, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. Yeah, very, very graphic. Great, thanks. Hi, uh, Jonathan's up from the Association for Technology. Um, in the uh, first thing you mentioned, in terms of procurement policies with respect to IP, there's a real focus on counterfeit goods, which is obviously very important. But I wonder about some of the more gray area aspects of IP, where um, the promotion of IP. Uh, it's sort of a back seat to other sort of national objectives. So in areas like green IT or clean IT or clean technology generally, uh, standards development, et cetera. I think some of those things are being used around the world almost as a form of protectionism. And so I, I guess um, I'll come into your office later to expand on this, but I want to make sure that any kind of a national IT policy includes in it the true promotion of IT and that doesn't take a back seat to Sure, I mean, certainly in general terms, I would agree with you. And anything, and that's my sort of allusion to industrial policies, a not very fleshed out allusion to industrial policies, went to that sort of issue. I think governments that are putting policies in place that are disadvantaging our IP industries or appear aimed at trying to um, create uh, an innovation industry or a research and development industry on the backs of our own companies is something we're very concerned about. Um, so please, I welcome you to come in. Thank you. Jim Bird from Washington Trade Daily. Um, the ACTA, is that a part of the strategic uh, plan at the White House? And uh, can you give us uh, an idea if this will be completed soon or what the future might be for it? Um, so ACTA is absolutely part of the joint strategic plan. Um, the president, as you know, President Obama uh, has spoken out recently and forcefully in support of ACTA. Um, in the joint strategic plan, we talk about using our trade policy tools in an effective way that covers a whole range of things, including Special 301, um, but ACTA and the successful conclusion of ACTA is an important part of that. Um, the negotiators are meeting now um, on ACTA, uh, and we, we hope um, and wish them best of luck in reaching a speedy conclusion to have a strong and effective agreement. Great. All right, thank you very much.
thank you so much. I really appreciate all your hard work and energy and, and look forward to working with you to move forward and making those changes. So thank you for spending time with us. We appreciate it. So I'm going to uh, I'm going to introduce our other panelists, and then we should have uh, plenty of time for comments and discussion as well. So um, uh, I'm just going to go down the order here. On my immediate left, we have uh, Stephen Medelitz, who is a partner at Mitchell, Silver, Berg, and, uh, and Knupp, uh, who has um, been for over 15 years advising the companies and trade associations on uh, intellectual property issues, international, uh, international anti-piracy and other copyright matters. Since 94, Steve has been counsel to the intellectual, International Intellectual Property Alliance, the leading coalition of U.S. copyright industry on intellectual, international copyright law. He's also served, just completed his sixth term as president of the Intellectual Property Constituency of ICANN's generic name supporting organization. Uh, previously, he was uh, a general counsel to the Information Industry Association, has had staff positions in the U.S. Senate. Uh, and has a law degree uh, from Georgetown, so I welcome him. Uh, to his left is Morgan Reed, who is the Executive Director of the Association for Competitive Technology. Uh, in, uh, in that role, Morgan uh, in particular specializes in issues around patents and copyright in the digital age. Um, I guess just last week testified House Judiciary Senate, House. House Judiciary on these issues as well, so he's actively involved in advising policymakers on this. Um, and um, has a background actually in, in technology companies and software and spent time in China and speaks Mandarin and knows all, can, can translate those Chinese patents if you need any help. <laughs> <laughs> time for me to go back to my other job. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, next to him is Emery Simon. Uh, Emery is a counsel for a BSA, the Business Software Alliance, and uh, works uh, uh, pretty much focused on the issues around domestic and international uh, copyright information security. Um, and you know what? That's the uh, that's the end of your bio. <laughs> so uh, I don't know what happened. So anyway, I've known Emery for a long time, and you want to tell me your bio? I mean, yeah. Yeah. We can switch. Yeah, mine is too long. So, uh, needless to say, Emery is really one of the leading experts in this whole issue, particularly with when it when it comes to uh, when it comes to software. And finally, uh, my colleague at ITIF, Daniel Castro, who is the, really the main person at ITIF who focuses on these issues around copyright, particularly uh, digital copyright, and uh, commend a report that we issued last December out there called Steal These Policies, which was, uh, if you remember that, I don't know how many people remember that. I, I, I always use these allusions to the 60s and very few people in it. Uh, <laughs> Hoffman, Steal This Book. Okay, you got it. All right, and Daniel has a um, master's degree in computer science from uh, from uh, Carnegie Mellon. So why don't we? I think we'll start here with Stephen, and we can just if you want to do it from there. We can sure. Great. Thank you. Thanks very much, Rob. Thanks everybody for, for turning out on this uh, beautiful morning. And perhaps we are moving into the autumnal equinox. So make sure the light is close. Okay. Um, I, I'd like to, to pick up on a couple of things that uh, Victoria Espinel said, uh, and, and um, uh, first of all, just uh, she mentioned at the outset that this is a bipartisan issue on the Hill, which is, which is certainly true and is certainly an asset in terms of uh, meaningful policy. But it's also a, a, an issue on which uh, we've had very strong, I will say, rhetorical support from the highest levels of the administration. I think we've had the President of the United States and the Vice President of the United States speaking forcefully and often on this topic, on the importance of intellectual property to our economy uh, and to our global competitiveness and on, the, uh, on how important it is to, uh, to protect that asset uh, in the world today. I don't think we've ever quite encountered that previous administration. So I think we, we in, in that sense, were very well situated with very strong support at the top from all the cabinet members that have spoken on this, uh, and, and as well as from the congressional leaders on both sides of the aisle and in both houses. That's a great setup uh, for moving forward, but the, the challenge, of course, is to translate the, the good words and strong words into meaningful action. So let me just 
mention a couple of areas where I think uh, there needs to be attention to that. Uh, the position of the Intellectual Property Enforcement Coordinator was created by the Pro-IP Act, which Congress passed uh, just about two years ago. And um, it, it is an important position, and I, I think, as one who worked on the Pro-IP Act extensively, I think uh, most people are quite uh, pleased with how with the progress that's been made so far. The first joint strategic plan is, is bringing down curtains all over America. <laughs> And um, uh, I, I think it was a very, a very a good document, and uh, certainly a lot of the initiatives that she talked about are, are very important. But there are a lot of other things that have to happen to fulfill some of the potential in the Pro-IP Act. We need to make sure that all the activities there are fully funded and that there's adequate support given to those important initiatives. Not too many people, a lot of people know about uh, the, the Joint Strategic Plan report that Victoria's office put out, not many people know that it was really developed by a skeleton crew, almost single-handedly, I think. Uh, Victoria Espinel, with very little uh, staff support and, and uh, very few resources, drew together this, this document. That needs, she definitely needs to have the funding and the tools uh, and the resources that are needed to get her very daunting job done. And then there were a number of other areas uh, either that were, uh, it, it were uh, enacted in the Pro-IP Act or some things that were tossed overboard during the Pro-IP Act legislative process. The Pro-IP Act focused primarily, besides the ITEC position, on uh, activities within the Justice Department, and obviously those need to be funded and, and supported. But uh, there were also other areas that where uh, we can improve the, the work of other agencies in the intellectual property enforcement area. So there's some of that's in the custom, the CDP reauthorization, customs reauthorization legislation. Uh, some of that is in uh, other legislation to increase the number of intellectual property attachés that are posted at embassies and to give them a uh, clearer mandate uh, to work on many of these tough international issues. All, of, all some of those are, are are, are they're, they're not lofty new legislative initiatives, but they are the important kind of follow through that's needed to make sure that the Pro IP Act lives up to its potential. Um, the, the, the other question that the Joint Strategic Plan raises is Are there new legal tools needed? Do we need to change our laws? Not only, do we need not only to uh, use more effectively the resources we have now and the legal remedies that we have now, but our new laws need it, and there's this 120-day uh, review that uh, Victoria mentioned that uh, my calendar is correct will probably uh, culminate in the next month or so, and uh, we're looking forward to seeing what recommendations come out of that for possible uh, legislative changes <laughs> to uh, strengthen uh, U.S. intellectual property law to examine the appropriateness of penalties that, that are imposed for violations and other uh, legislative changes that could uh, facilitate enforcement. Uh, at the same time, of course, the Capitol Hill is not necessarily waiting for the 120-day review, and we now have uh, before the Senate a piece of legislation from Senator Leahy, uh, co-sponsored by most of the members of the Judiciary Committee, that I think is it could be it's potentially a very important Part of the response to the challenge that uh, Victoria talked about in terms of internet uh, piracy. It's not a, a, by any means a panacea for dealing with the internet piracy problems, but its goal is to its goal is to provide some new legal tools for the most egregious types of online piracy, for sites that are really dedicated to infringing activities, not internet piracy in general, but the worst of the worst such sites, and to provide quick uh, remedies within a, a context of due process and, and, uh, uh, and balance to, to uh, enable action to be taken against these types of rogue sites. Um, it, it does provide some extraordinary remedies, but the challenge is to fit that with a, a focused definition of sites, so that those are only used against sites that are really in the business of stealing the intellectual property of uh, U.S. authors and U.S. Uh, right holders and of, uh, and, and of 
U.S. trademark owners in, in the counterfeiting sphere. Um, you know, uh, our, our moderator um, mentioned that we are sometimes uh, have to deal with knee-jerk reactions uh, to, uh, to some of these initiatives, and ACT is a great example, I think, where the, I think the opponents uh, were acting, uh, well, perhaps charitably, to say they were acting on reflex uh, in the way that they opposed uh, or an opposing ACT and, and urging that it, uh, that it be weakened. We'll have to see what, what what finally comes out in that, but I hope people will also uh, suppress their urge to uh, engage in knee-jerk reactions about uh, Senator Leahy's bill. Uh, it, it is trying to address, I think, a very serious problem and trying to come up with a, a focused and uh, uh, carefully fashioned remedy uh, for it. So you know, we'll see what the final outcome is going to be, but uh, I think that's certainly the intent behind it and potentially it could uh, could be a very powerful tool I think for dealing with some of the worst aspects some of the least defensible aspects of, uh, uh, of the world that we encounter on the I'll just say in closing that uh, the last point I want to mention from what Victoria said her voluntary initiatives uh, I think is very important ideally that is the best way to, to address a lot of the problems of internet piracy through cooperation, through bringing the uh, industry players together. So uh, I'm, I'm glad that she's doing that. I commend her for that effort, and hopefully that also uh, will bear fruit in the future. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Mark. Well, thank you, I don't usually have a tr uh, trouble being heard, so um, hopefully the mic will pick it up. Uh, it was interesting to hear Victoria's uh, statement coming out today. Uh, those of us who have been working on a lot of these issues have been overwhelmed by how many hours she's put in and how many meetings that she has done, and her willingness, uh, you know, open door is a policy that gets uh, you know thrown around in Washington, D.C. a lot, but uh, I can tell you with, with with true uh, true vision that she has let just about everyone come in and talk to her about the value of IP for their companies. And I think that is an enormous change and of, of enormous value for those of us who care about IP. There are three specific things that I thought were interesting about the policy and I think uh, inform my membership and, and, and really alter the way that we're looking at it moving forward. And maybe I take a moment to, to mention it. A lot of the folks that talk about intellectual property have physical goods that are pirated. They have brake pads that are made of sawdust instead of asbestos. They have um, medical medical devices that are phony. They have fake drugs. Well, our folks are strictly in the digital space. We represent about 3,000 small and medium-sized technology companies who build software or build custom software or put your things together in a way that they work. Some of our folks are the guys in the khakis and the blue shirts who come in to plug all your devices and hopefully they all work together. So for our folks, everything happens in this digital space. Very little happens in, in physical space. So from Victoria's report, one of the things that I was uh, most impressed with and we've been working with them on is this internet focus. Their willingness to understand that the next generation of intellectual property happens in a virtual space. Now, it has real world impacts, as you've heard her discuss, uh, internet, false internet pharmacies heard from the auto industry and, and the freight and the faith break pads. So what's happening in digital space has physical implications, but it also has major impact on our folks' ability to sell and move products forward that, that never appear in, in any physical fashion. The other area that we're really impressed with is her willingness to go to battle with other agencies. One of the areas that has been fascinating is watching her try to take out red tape in something like the customs office. Uh, it's an arcane area, but for a long time, if you were to look at a chip, uh, you would send the chip to the potentially infringed person when it comes in on the dock and say, is this real? Is this serial number a real serial number? And then Intel or whatever AMD would look at it and say, well, we've never had a serial number that starts with 456, so that's fake. That was great. Well, the problem is the Trade Secret Act creates a problem for the customs office to go in and show that product to an AMD or an Intel and say, by the way, is this really yours? So Victoria has been tireless to try to get 
some of that red tape cut out of the way so that, in fact, Intel or AMD or Apple or anyone else can take a look at that product and say, <laughs> not ours, and stop it at the door before it comes in. Um, the third aspect in the herder, 98% of it is China. Uh, one of the things that China presents a problem for our membership is quite a bit different than for, say, a Microsoft or an Adobe. Uh, our folks are standing by the jump rope and saying, you know what, I'm not bothering to get in. Because the barrier to entry is so large when you consider the implications of losing your technology, you don't even bother to jump in. One of our members, Gary Muller, he has a product, a digital product that um, improves scanners. He has a US patent. He has a patent in a couple of countries in the EU. He's turned out a great product. It isn't cheap. It's about a $10,000 software package that improves high-end scanners. Gary's attitude towards China, why bother? He knows the day that that software hits the ground in China, it's done. Gary's company is out in Virginia, has eight employees. He doesn't have an army of lawyers. He doesn't have an army of people at the customs office to make sure that it happens. So for him, China isn't a problem in that it's stealing stuff. China's a problem for him because he's not even bothering to get in the game. And for the small and medium-sized developers, that is a completely tragic situation, especially because as we talk about IP, all this focus on, on piracy has a, has a kind of a Scrooge McDuck feeling. It's mine, it's mine, I don't want anyone to use it. But in fact, the beauty of intellectual property, especially in patents, is, is that you let it out there. You let people use it. You get into a position where you can be licensed. And for small folks, this is an enormous impact in two key ways. One, it gives you a chance to get in front of venture capitalists. I have something. It may be of value. Would you like to give me some money so I can build it out? And two, in the crowded digital space, it's hard to get attention. And when you have a patent or intellectual property in some way that you can identify, it allows your competitors and your potential acquirers to know that you exist. It's a, look at me, I'm here. And those two assets are enormously powerful for intellectual property. So while we talk about IP, we have to remember that the positive sides of it are an improvement in innovation, a push forward on productivity, and, and hopefully uh, an increase in jobs. Um, Emery, I, I was figuring that given my, my youthfulness, um, Emery would, would uh, start off with um, DSA's numbers, and he's got some great numbers to share on, on, on the overall picture. But I wanted to uh, bring down some of the great numbers that BSA has about software piracy and make it more specific. There's a company in upstate New York called Ambrosia Software. 12 employees, they've been around since the 90s make great stuff, little widgets, um, things for the iPhone. Uh, they made uh, Snaps Pro, a, a great screen capture program. They've been very successful. Back in 2001, they started really analyzing how, how much piracy affects them. And this is a company that delivers their software through shareware, meaning you download it. Then if you want full features, you pay some money. Great, you get a license code, you move forward. In back, back in the early part of 2000s, 2002, they did a study and found over 50%, 50 percent of people who were coming to them for software updates were using pirated codes. And this isn't one guy just hammering the server. This is 50% unique folks going to Ambrosia saying, uh, I'd like to update, but my code is fake. So I called them, I called the CEO and said, so how is it looking for you today? And he said, well, you know, we have good news and bad news. I've lowered our piracy rate. But to do so, here's what we had to do. First, in 2008, we got rid of games completely. So this is a company that had a nice product line making shareware games. It was successful. They dropped them completely. It was just too expensive to pay the person to monitor the number of license codes that were out there being stolen. So this isn't a matter of them you know, not hiring more people. They just gave up. So in 2008, no more games launched. Dropped their piracy rate from 50% to 39%, right like that. Games are a big part of the problem. Second, they shifted uh, their business model in a way that they essentially have somebody, a full-time employee, who could be writing software now, who spends his time monitoring BitTorrent sites, monitoring other sites, looking for code. And the other part, and the really insidious part of this job, is the other person, that, that job the person does the rest of the time, is talk to real customers to tell them why their software isn't working. And so while you think about it, well, who cares if you screw the pirates? The problem is you've got a customer service problem. If you're Microsoft, well, you've got an army of those folks in Iowa with headsets talking to people. When you're 12 men in, uh, in uh, Rochester, somebody's got to be on the phone to say, uh, yes, Mrs. Jones, I'm sorry your software doesn't work. 
your license code showed up pirated, we had to shut it down. Can you validate yourself? Da, 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 da. Customer's not happy. You have, to, you have to be proactively making them happy on the flip side. If you say, well, we'll give you an update for the next version. Huge cost, huge cost to face, and huge cost on customer service side. And then last, and I think the most <coughs> interesting part that they're going through right now is they've made a move to retail boxes. And while this sounded like a good idea initially, they, they went into Japan, which has, as, as Emory will say, Japan's kind of got a little piracy rate. But I, I'll read you this quote, and then I'll close. Our change, we made a change in our licensing system to allow for the sale of software in retail boxes in Japan. These codes are easier to steal since they only need to be remain, they need to remain active while the software sits waiting to be sold. We've had to only blacklist four pirated retail codes in our system, but attempts to use those codes have made up 75% of the total retail registrations logged by our system in the past two months. This shortfall of our retail venture likely limits the volume of business we can do in this space. I can't really say it any better myself, but there it is. Boom. They're already looking at that as a failed op uh, an object lesson and a failed attempt at expanding their market. So, while the numbers, the billions, the millions uh, affect on the IP industry, what you need to remember is it has a direct downstream effect on small, medium-sized companies who are based all over the nation, even in places like Rochester, New York. Great. Thank you, Warren. Emory. <coughs> I'm old for so <laughs> um, it. By, by the way, I was, I was an early user of Ambrosia's game software, and when they stopped doing it, it increased my productivity dramatically. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, okay, so um, Victoria has spoke about things the administration is doing, and uh, a lot of things that they're doing are good. And it, I will come back in a moment to talk about what I perceive to be the biggest problem in the administration scheme. Uh, so let me um, let me do what, what Morgan advertised and tell you a little bit about the software industry. And, and we talk about piracy as this nebulous thing that is that hurts everybody the same way. Am I messing up the microphone? Uh, that hurts everybody the same way and it affects all industries the same way. And the answer is it hurts everybody. Software presents, I think, a unique challenge. It's a tragedy that we are losing a lot of our cultural heritage because the music industry is unable to generate creative <coughs> artists to bring them to us for us to listen to creative things. Can I ask you your question? Yeah. Sorry. So, is that better? Uh, so, that, so, it's a kind of tragedy to have lost or, or to be losing our cultural heritage. I think we absolutely need to do something about that. It's a job strategy that we don't do more about software types. Software industry is a little different than other public contract based and electric product based industries. Um, software is an input to production. Every manufacturing and service business today uses software to a greater or lesser extent and relies on it to conduct its business. The less creative software is available to them, less they can do. Software affects productivity. It affects efficiency and prices. Software affects competitiveness. If you use software in the right way, you're more competitive. If you don't, you're less competitive. It's a reality of, of the economics. Software has network effects. So it's got these virtuous cycles, these virtuous reinforcing elements in how companies operate at the economy. When software is stolen, there is less software out there to be used, which means we are ultimately, as an economy, whether it's Ambrosia, whether it's large companies, the companies hurt. But when software gets stolen, the economy hurts because of the job effects, because of the productivity effects, because of the price effects. It's important to keep that in mind. It's also important to keep in mind uh, just the sheer size of the software industry. The software industry is about quarter of a trillion dollars, it's about $260 billion. And through the recession that we've gone through the last couple of years, software sales have actually remained pretty steady. So it's an industry that has kept up during the worst of these economic times. That's important to keep in mind, too. We employ about a million and a half people. 
And for every dollar spent on software, about four dollars are spent in services and um, in uh, distribution. So it's got all these multiplier effects. It's, it's, and again, uh, Rob does a lot of economics work to sort of bring these concepts along that piracy is not about information going to be free and you know, see that it's okay. And it's about the fact that people lose jobs and people lose employment and people lose their ability to make their lives better when we tolerate piracy. So just um, <coughs> Facts. We recently put out a study, which I commend to all of you, it's on our website. It analyzes the economic impact of about 40 countries that a 10% reduction in software would have. So if we were to reduce all the, the piracy rates in 46 countries by about 10%, we would get um, about $142 billion worth of additional economic activity. We'd get about half a million additional jobs. And we also calculate the impact on government companies. We get about $32 billion worth of additional tax revenue from the government. Remember, pirates don't pay taxes. So when we look at these piracy numbers, and again, I'm trying to bring them back into the context of, it's about how we operate as a society, but it's more importantly about how we as individuals do our jobs better or worse. Whether we have jobs at all. So I wanted to come back to, uh, so uh, again, I, I, I spent half my time telling you about numbers, and we have lots more numbers, but it's important to keep in mind that software, and again, all the criticism of other copyright-based industries are really using. Software is an input to economic activity in a way that other copyright-based industries are not, and it's important to keep that in mind. The, the piracy rate, by the way, uh, the, the losses of piracy of our industry, for foregone sales, we estimate to be about $50 billion a year, uh, which is roughly about the size of the music and movie industry combined. Um, so just our losses are about the same as, as those industries. Um, there are two, there are two uh, sort of major piracy issues that confront us today and going forward. One is the internet set of issues, which Steve talked about that I'm going to spend a lot of time on. Except to note, the internet is not the software industry's biggest problem. And all the attention that Victoria and others in the administration and Congress play to internet issues are helping certain copyright-based industries, but they are not doing a whole lot for the largest industry that is subject to the largest dollar losses in terms of piracy. Our problem is corporate copy. Our problem is companies that buy a single copy, make dozens of additional copies for their employees without <coughs> That's where the, no, the internet-based piracy is a problem, and I'm not at all suggesting it's not. It's just not a be-all and end-all that it is being sort of, that there's a certain public perception that occurs that if we were to so solve internet piracy, we would solve the piracy problem. That is not the case. Second of all, internet piracy, a lot of the solutions people propose are about hamstringing the technology, about in disabling functions, about not letting the internet operate. We think that's a mistake. We think we need to be very smart about how we attack those things without killing the goose, um, without uh, this, uh, creating disincentives for technology to progress, to get better, to provide us better things. Most of the stuff that goes on the internet, let's face it, is good and legal. There's a small percentage that's bad, and we need to not vilify the internet because there's some bad actors out there. All right, my last point. Um, China is our industry's major problem. The administration has tried hard. And the administration has tried hard to an approach that goes from ministerial to ministerial with promise to promise and with no binding consequence to promises unfulfilled. At the same time, China is proceeding with indigenous innovation policies which are also aimed at transferring IP. And we are left in a place where the Chinese are being admonished, but there's no consequence to their actions. So traditional economic policy with respect to China, which has been focused on a series of commitments from ministerial to ministerial, clearly has not produced the results that we all want. 
So we have advocated, we advocate a shift in that policy to look at results, not at promises. Results is measured by increased U.S. sales or decreased legal sales of U.S. technology, whether it's hardware or software, whether it's movies or books or music. It's about results that count, not about promises. And we need to reorient the administration, we believe, needs to reorient its policy towards China to be a results-based, performance-based set of criteria, not a series of commitments that are not enforceable. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you. Daniel? First, I want to say, you know, we absolutely, um, I think, should uh, applaud the Obama's administration to um, renew the focus on IT infringement. That's something that we've needed for a while. What I'd like to do is spend a few minutes talking about like, some digital piracy issues again. I think one of the problems is that people don't recognize uh, the impact of digital piracy has. As Rob mentioned at the beginning of this conversation, um, when you compare software to cars, you know, there's, there's a lot of um, People see that as a different thing. If somebody's stealing millions of dollars worth of cars from GM, the government will clearly step in. But when this happens online, because there's not the physical evidence that this happening, people are less likely to care about the issue and demand government intervention, even though at the end of the day, the impact is the same. You have uh, fewer sales, and as a result, you have fewer jobs. I think the other problem that you have is that some people see this as kind of a see piracy as in modern or digital version of a lot of these scenario. There was a bishop, I think, in the UK that said, you know, it's okay to steal as long as you're stealing from these big corporations. Um, at first, I think the idea of poor, at least on the global sense, is wrong. I mean, you know, what about China here? Uh, they top the list for piracy and they have a uh, trade deficit. And piracy today, you know, when, when you think about it, you think about the evolution of online piracy, most people think of teenagers in the dorm room trading files among their friends. And you know, today, piracy is a global, multi-million dollar business. Right? And it's a business that's hurting American companies. I had the opportunity to go to uh, Brunei this summer for an APEC conference. And as you see in a lot of, I think, uh, countries where IP infringement is high, uh, it's, it's very open and prevalent. They had kind of a tour around the city, and you know, you're going around in this bus, and you're pointing out, oh, here's you know, our famous mosque, here's the, um, Palace, and here's where you can go and buy DVDs for a dollar uh, and take them home with you. You know, and that's that's part of the tour. That's just part of the culture there. Um, and so, why is it? Well, there's a lot of reasons. One is, of course, that um, mostly they're infringing on non-Nigerian uh, content creators. There's not a lot of IP uh, holders in the country. Uh, the penalties are low. They do have sweeps, but you know, they come in and shut down the malls for a day. And then Say it's back on the running again. Um, but the problem right now, I think, isn't so much the Brunei's of the world, it's a small country, um, although that needs to be fixed. The problem is the digital Brunei's. Uh, the countries that allow businesses to set up storefronts online uh, that facilitate piracy. And you know, we see plenty of examples of this in, it's in Russia, where they can see all of it on read.com, where anyone anywhere in the world can go online and buy anything, period, for 99 cents under this. Um, you know, this claim of legality, which clearly isn't, isn't true on the global sense. Uh, so I think it makes sense for the U.S. to um, focus on stopping piracy online. Some of this. Uh, this report that we put out in December of last year talks about how there's a lot of technical solutions that are available now. Uh, there's more that can be done with content identification uh, to have uh, social social networks, social uh, social media places like YouTube identify pirated content more easily and take it down. But there still needs to be legislative and industry <coughs> uh, to cut off the revenue streams to these businesses, because these are businesses at the end of the day. Uh, you know, right now, you can use a search engine to easily find uh, find these results. There's advertising on all of these uh, piracy websites. Right now, uh, the shift has been from you know, downloading, for example, over peer-to-peer -peer networks movie that you download to the computer, now you have more uh, cloud-based uh, offerings, so you can go online and stream a movie. Uh, when we did our study in December, we looked around and we looked at who's advertising these sites. And it turns out it's not some, you know, um, 
other illegal groups. These are mainstream companies that are advertising. They're not necessarily advertising um, knowingly, but they're using advertising numbers that aren't forcing uh, ready for the rat. So you had, uh, you know, Blockbuster, British Airways, and Sprint, all advertising on these uh, websites that the only purpose was to provide pirated content. <clears throat> this morning, I actually, um, I did a search and I looked for uh, you know, Iron Man 2, the top grossing movie of 2010. And I found that, you know, in the first five, five hits on Google, um, you know, five different websites, they were all streaming it. Uh, they had an ad for Cuba uh, right next to it while you could watch it. So it's just incredible what's happened today. And I think that's why uh, the legislation that has been proposed um, is a step in the right direction. These kind of proposals, and this was what we had proposed in our paper, um, is that you need to do something to cut out the revenue streams. Uh, so, for example, this proposal would, uh, if, it's, if it's a company or if it's a domain that's registered in the United States, if it's a .com or a .net, that would all be in the United States, the action could be that the Justice Department can come in and get the domain, the domain registrar to take down the site or the web host to take down the site. Um, it could also ask the credit card companies to cut off and financial transactions, and it could ask uh, advertisers to stop advertising on those sites. If it's outside the U.S., the Justice Department would be creating a blacklist. And I, again, I think this is um, this is important because this is a step you can actually take. Uh, usually, you can't do a lot of, to enforce copyright infringement outside the country. This is actually a fairly easy step. So it did require, or not require, actually, this bill is just voluntary. The ISPs would block access to sites that are only infringing the content. Um, and of course, we've seen a lot of pushback already on this. Uh, I think part of the problem is some groups simply don't support any kind of IP enforcement. Um, you know, when, uh, when President or Vice President Biden um, you know, kicked off uh, you know, a, a set of meetings with uh, Victoria Espinel back in, in January of last year, people even rejected basic comments like IRC currency comments. You know, we can't agree on the basic facts, it's hard to have a real discussion on this. Um, but I would criticize the bill because of potential abuses. And certainly, I think we need to talk about safeguards in place to protect free speech, protect civil liberties, but these risks are not a reason not to move forward. Um, you know, we have police abuse, but that doesn't mean we get rid of law enforcement. I think it's the same with piracy. <laughs> if we start thinking about uh, this issue and the solutions, we need to think about aggressive solutions that are the modern and new technology in ways. And finally, I just want to close by mentioning um, you know, Silicon Valley often complains that Washington doesn't do anything to help it. There was this article in TechCrunch uh, was a few months back that made the argument that policymakers, if they want to help Silicon Valley, they should just stay out of it. Stay out of it. And you know, first, that's, I mean, it's kind of false. I mean, you know, Washington has done a lot um, for funding startups. You know, Google has its, um, its origins from DOD funding. Um, but more broadly, enforcing IP rights domestically and abroad is a good way to watch for the really health the innovators in the country thrive. Uh, so certainly I think in today's economic climate, a focus on low-cost ways of spurring innovation is good policy and easy. Um, Great, thank you, Daniel. Um, I want to, uh, before I turn over to the, to the <coughs> questions, I, I just want to get some other people's thoughts on Emory. Point, which uh, I have to say, I, I think we, we're pretty much come around to that point of view, which is uh, China, and, and not, they're not the only country, but certainly China is the most egregious country who will, you know, uh, I'd love to be <coughs> playing poker against us. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm all in, and uh, okay, we will full. China essentially will do whatever needs to be done, they will say whatever needs to be said, and they will continue to do what they're doing, because frankly, it is in their interest in the short run long run, I don't believe it is, but in the short run, it is in their interest to steal as much as possible. Uh, and they will continue to do that, and they will do it until we make it name and such. So I guess the question is, uh, do other folks agree with this notion that there needs to be more of a results-based regime? And if so, how does that work a little bit more specifically? Well, I think we know that the status quo is not working. It's time to, to be thinking about alternatives, as, uh, uh, as Emory suggests. And uh, the challenge is always to come up with some way to quantify um, uh, quantify the results and to, to try to hold uh, China or whatever other country there is uh, that, that's involved uh, to 
through those results. So I don't, I don't know specifically how a, a performance-based regime would necessarily work in China, but it's certainly true that um, the, the cycle we've gotten ourselves into um, with the, the various uh, joint meetings and, and uh, other, uh, I would say, bureaucratic uh, wheel spinning that seems to dominate a lot of our relationship with China simply is, isn't working, isn't producing results in these areas. So if you listen to this entire discussion so far, it has taken the approach of America dictating to China. And if you talk to folks in China and you talk to, you know, graduates of their Harvard Beida, they have a new outlook on the world, one that is much more akin to, well, you guys can't you guys can't keep your own economy right, so you can't tell us what to do. And whether that's right or appropriate, I think that and I and I completely agree, it's gotta be a results based. But I think we have to start with the basic concept that China is never going to do what we ask them to do because it's good for us. All right? The only way that China is ever going to do something that's beneficial to us is if it's also beneficial to them. They are in the process of developing entrepreneurial culture in the southern parts of China, in some of the coastal areas. They still do not have the same culture for entrepreneurship that we do. They do not have the same embrace of failure that we do. Um, those are aspects that you probably don't think of but are the key to moving forward on entrepreneurial, an entrepreneurial environment. But what we have to do is look for ways to make it beneficial to them, either as a nation or to individuals that are at the table. I mean, there are things that they want. They want uh, approbation from the world. They want to be seen as the power that they are. Uh, they want to be recognized for their the, the changes that they've made. But that also means that you can continue to apply pressure to say, that was great, how about next year? I think the other part that we have to recognize as we find ways to make it relevant to them is what turns their crank? What bothers the Chinese? We well, you know what bothers the Chinese a lot? Having their internal intellectual property stolen by the Vietnamese. Having some of the other nations around China that are now moving forward because they have lower cost labor, easier, in easier intellectual property, property regimes, um, less government oversight. Those folks are now stealing from the Chinese. Right now, China is the lead in ground mount solar panel PV. All right, they're it. They're beating our tails on that green technology. Well, if folks are looking to uh, Vietnam to have that stuff built using the technology that was developed in China, that upsets the Chinese. So finding ways that we can work with them to help police other developing nations that are stealing their stuff, well, that's a, that's a chit in our bank that helps us go back and say, look, we're losing a lot of face on this. We need your help to go after the following <coughs> specifically identified problem area. A specific business in China that, say, has 85% piracy rate of all their Adobe products. Working to give some very specific things where there's a little quid pro quo, but also knowing that you're never going to get it just because we told them to do it. And I think, I think that the overall aspect of this in dealing with China and finding the specific results is to make it incremental, to not to not give in, and, and in this case, Emory was right, not give in to, the, to these broad spectrum 60,000 foot level asks, but um, make them smaller. Make the event smaller. Make the face that can be gained or lost smaller. And make them very specific. And I would say that uh, as we approach China in the future, that's going to be a big part of it. And I'd say the last thing, and I would tie it to uh, um, what Dan said, and something we all know to be true in this room, which is, Part of the problem the government has in doing a better job of enforcing IP rights is because a lot of US companies don't really want to stick their hand in the bear trap and, and stick it to China. So they have to take a position of saying, we want better IP enforcement with China, but we don't want to be the chin. We don't want to lead that fight because it may cost us market share in country. It may cost us business opportunities. It may cost us acquisitions that we would make in China. So businesses of two minds. They want access to this enormous burgeoning China market, but they also want IP enforcement. So the, the, the real answer to this, find a way to make it about them. Um, uh, Emory, unless you want 30 seconds on this, I want to 
give people a chance to drop in. Yeah, I, I mean, I do want thirty seconds. I, I, mean, I think Morgan presents a, an interesting proposition as a long-term solution, which is make it as matters of Chinese self-interest. Uh, but as somebody's funny talking about which I mean, Keynes said the long-term world dead. Um, <laughs> so um, I, you know, I, I actually don't think they're a technology exporter that really comes up more interesting proposition. Meanwhile, uh, our market is wide open to China, and their market is not quite open to us. And uh, they do have a major self-interest, which is in their ability to continue exporting from the U.S. And if they can't do that, um, their economy starts sputtering, and they start feeling pain. So when we look at results-based approaches, we need to look at that trade balance and the trade imbalance. And the way you measure it is, are we selling more? So today, software companies make about a billion dollars in China. There's about 20 billion software book in circulation every year. So that's $19 billion that are left on the table for U.S. companies. Uh, making that $15 billion would be good. Making that $2 billion would be even better. So you want metrics and sales. Great. Steve. Thanks, Ron. Steve Del Bianco with NetChoice. And there's a lot of uh, calls for actions and results, but we've got to remember that actions have consequences. The nations who harbor businesses that make money on IP infringement, they will fight back. They'll react in, in ways, not just in resentment, but in specific ways that put the squeeze on American companies who get caught in the crossfire. I'll give you one example. Uh, Visa was, was shown by the recording industry where Alltunes.com, a Russian website, was selling stolen music. Visa became convinced they needed to shut down, no longer process payments in this Russian And they did so. Well, the company sued, and a Russian court ordered them to reinstate service to keep processing payments, and they wanted Visa to pay damages. So companies like that can get caught in a crossfire with other regimes where they do business. The same thing's going to be true on American registries and registrars who will take action pursuant to legislation like Laney or uh, advertising networks who are going to shut down their ad contract for sort of late. I love the intentions of the bill, but let's think about not squeezing American businesses who are going to be caught between other regimes who want to preserve the economic advantages they currently achieve through infringement. Oh, I, I think you, you, know, you make a fair point, Steve, but um, you know, at the end of the day, you know, company isn't supposed to profit from something that's illegal. Um, so advertising on a site that's, for the first, for the first of all, uh, most of these advertising networks actually say they're not supposed to be doing this. It's just an issue of them not fulfilling their promise. Um, and there has been, um, this summer, actually, a, I think a, re a renewed effort by some of the advertising networks to say, we will try and track down this more. Um, so it may be that you know, they don't actually have to um, a voluntary mechanism will, will get there. But if the Justice Department is providing a list of sites that are blacklisted, that actually makes it easier for the street because then they don't have to track them around. Unless they get sued by the countries where they shut the list. Hi, I'm Rob App. I'm with Compliance Consulting in Los Angeles, and I work mainly in the film industry. And just to follow up on something Morgan said and the point Andrew was making about Dubai. Uh, one thing that the Chinese are concerned about, I travel to China frequently, is the fact that their virtually movie business, the movies are all available here in the United States, usually in Chinatowns, the gray market, and pirate versions. And we can probably score points with the Chinese by making that, or, and a lot of other cultures around the world, the Koreans, the Nigerians, uh, place, all of their intellectual property is openly sold in their ethnic neighborhoods, and there's certainly no enforcement on the U.S. side to try to curtail any of that. You, like you nodding your head. Yeah, no, I, I agree completely. I mean, it was more of a statement than a question, but I, I agree. <laughs> so, so yeah, and I, and I think that the only point I would add is um, Emery's right about the long term versus short term. I believe we may have lost some of our short term opportunities in the past, so. Yeah, we have to put the thumb screws down, but we also have to gain some points. We also have to do those things. So I think this has to have both a short and a long-term outlook. Thank you.
Agreed. Yeah, I, I, I think I would disagree up to a point, which is that, uh, of course, all the laws that we're talking about here apply to uh, Korean intellectual property, Korean works, and, and Chinese works, and Nigerian works in the United States. We have, at least in the copyright area, we have copyright relations with all of those countries. So all of those <coughs> cases could be brought, and um, so the question is, if they're not being brought, why not? That, that's maybe the, the, the way to ask it. I, don't, I, I agree with you that it would be very salutary for um, for some of these cases to be brought and for and be publicized uh, to show that the U.S. is serious about protecting the intellectual property rights of all authors and all creators, not just their own. From, I, I used to work in New York. Oh, my name is Sylvia Syracuse, and I'm a uh, marketing events director at broadbandbreakfast.com. But at the previous position, I worked in New York's Chinatown, so I'm a little familiar with what you're saying. And that you know, it's the same, similar problem, and that you'll you'll shut people down, and they'll just someone else will take over, reopen, and get the stuff again. So I'm just saying, even I mean, things got got better in your Chinatown. Still, sort of like people sort of gave up on enforcement in many ways, and um, you know, I think it's the cultural issues like more of the same that need to be addressed. Tom Allen from the Association of American Publishers. Uh, I found uh, in my, I've been to China actually three times since I took this job a year and a half ago. And on two of the occasions, there were government ministers who said our aim is to create uh, four or five or six uh, for-profit publishing industries in China that would be globally competitive. And at least in our industry, I think that the, the key may be figuring out how American book publishers can work with some Chinese publishers as they develop so that within China, we won't be just trying to enforce, uh, we won't be just stuck with enforcement, but we will build gradually over time, and, and, and in China this may mean a while, uh, build allies who have the same interest. And if the government, the government, uh, both of those government speakers said that we have to create a culture that respects copyright in order to have this kind of industry. Same is true here, of course. Uh, but, but I think that what came out of my last meeting is that we're more likely to do better uh, instead of just trying to get the U.S. government to put pressure on the Chinese on enforcement issues within China. We would do well to figure out, uh, you know, with the entities in China that we can build coalitions with and have them carry uh, some of the advocacy effort internally. I don't, I don't suggest for a moment that that is. Uh, through short-term results, but in the long term, it might uh, it might be. So just uh, just to add, to what, uh, I mean, you're, you're absolutely right. Which is uh, ultimately creating domestic vested interest is the way to create a culture of respect. Um, so it's more than me old. Uh, so in the mid 1980s, a company no longer exists, but which in its day was a leader, Digital Equipment Corporation Tech, uh, brought some computers into China and gave them to one particular university. And they had a tight agreement. <coughs> they felt good about it, and they felt they were going to teach computer science students how to use a tech machine, and they would want to start to. In six months, every university in China was running off tech machines that the Chinese had copied. So the ch and that that example is about 20 years old is unfortunately not an old example because it repeats itself all the time. So the challenge is yes, cooperate, yes, to nurture local interests, but the fear that a lot of particularly technology companies, which I work with, is to bring in your best first generation technology and bring it in. And so it's a tough conundrum. Quickly, I, I uh, started with Gary Muller's story because of exactly that problem, why he isn't bringing his $10,000 scanner software into, into China because he knows what Emory just said. Um, the problem really is, unfortunately, we're trade association guys, but a lot of the problem actually lies with you folks who are part of the companies because it's very hard to get 
American companies to go to the WTO and to bring an enforcement action. Um, BSA does a great job of going in, you know, target by target, but uh, we have a we have a conundrum. You know, I can talk about Gary. Gary's small. Gary doesn't have the leverage to go to the, to bring the same kind of action that others do. But um, if you leave here with anything, it's to go back to your, it's go back to the companies and the industries that are, are concerned about this and ask them to help because ultimately the action has to be taken by the large players who are both interested in the market opportunities China presents and concerned about the market, about the money that they're losing there. Without that, it won't get very far. Uh, it's expensive, time consuming, and um, uncertain, uh, politically uncertain. You, you anger the wrong person, it might hurt your ability to, to be part of an acquisition. It might hurt part of your ability to get a get a preferential deal. So there's that. There's the mix of the mix of issues. Yeah, just one other point on this. There, where there are, I don't disagree with what you said, but where there are opportunities to um, improve the enforcement of intellectual property in foreign markets, we should be taking them. And when you look at the situation with Korea, and I recognize Korea is not China, and, and it's not, you know, it's still one of the larger, largest economies in the world. And we've had, we negotiated with Korea a world-class free trade agreement that has uh, exceptional provisions on intellectual property that, that obligates them to do things both about internet piracy and about the type of piracy that, that Emory uh, highlighted in terms of the corporate and user piracy. And it's been sitting there for three years because, uh, for, obviously for a lot of reasons, but I think an administration that recognizes the importance of intellectual property for our current and future economic growth should be moving even faster than it is, which has been very slow, to try to bring the U.S.-Korea free trade agreement into, into force. And the problem is not on the Korean side, it's on the U.S. side. And we are basically letting an opportunity sit there and, and, uh, and uh, just, just sit for three years. Hopefully it won't have the case for another. Okay. So. To say one last thing I can't resist, and then, and then I'll uh, wrap it up here. Um, you know, this whole issue a little bit I, it sort of reminds me of a metaphor of Lucy and, and, and Charlie Brown in the football. I mean, uh, sort of, you know, how many times does Charlie Brown think she's going to hold the football and, and she always pulls it away? How long do we think China is going to do the right thing? Because they are not. They're not going to do the right thing. And what I guess frankly frustrates me about this debate is we have this debate about, well, you know, Chinese culture, something about the culture that is inherently thievery. Um, I don't buy that. Uh, Chinese daughter, uh, I don't think she's genetically a thief. Uh, I don't buy this notion that it's a time thing. Somehow we just give them all our industries, then they'll stop stealing. Yeah, in the long run we're all poor. So, but really, I guess the, the key issue to me is they are signatories of WTO. They are signatories of TRIPS. They didn't mean to do that. You sign a document, a legal document, you imply that you have obligations. You don't say, we can't sign this because our culture is a culture of thievery. We just can never live up to this. So we're not going to sign TRIPS, I'm sorry. No, they signed it. That means they have a legal obligation to do it, and it means we have a legal right to tell them to do it. So there's no shit somewhere that China is saying, who are we to tell them what to do? We have every right to tell them what to do in an international framework of laws because they're trading. Now, we don't have any right to tell them what to do about their own country. That doesn't affect the rest of the global trading system, but they're a partner in the global trade system, so they have to live by rules. By the way, I don't mean to pick on China because they're just, they're just the easiest, but there are many, many countries uh, who do this. And we, I, in our view, we need to just, you know, we need to stop, you know, wake up, realize that Lucy's never going to put the football there, and that it's up to us to figure out an end run around that. So with those metaphors, um, I really want to thank well, Victoria in, in her absence, uh, and then uh, four great uh, speakers and, and panelists here, and thank you all for, uh, for, for attending.